warmly welcome, welcome to this um, panel discussion with our esteemed uh, panelists. Uh, as said, my name is Tuija Pulkinen. I'm the Vice President for Research and Innovations, and I'm also a Professor of Space Science and Technology at the School of Electrical Engineering. This is a panel discussion, but we also welcome uh, questions from the audience. Do you think we uh, have adequate uh, training that we give to our PhDs to enter the job market uh, outside the academia? Question to anyone, either from within or from outside. Leah. Uh, maybe yes and no. I mean, it's uh, the problem. I come from the environmental sphere where, of course, uh, the the themes or the questions are really, I mean, if, like global challenges. You, you speak about uh, water crisis, climate change, urbanization. So, so it's that these questions are so broad and uh, that, that that may create a problem for a traditional uh, education, I think, because as far as I at least have experienced it, it tends to be pretty focused. And of course, you need that, but at the same time, you should be able to provide the students with the understanding how, how they, sh they could frame their own topic uh, in a broader scale or, or in, the, in the broader context. And I think that's where quite often, at least when I, that's what I've seen when, when we get new uh, PhDs in, into our institute, that they, they quite often have that kind of a problem that they, they, they yeah, this framing is, is often pretty tricky for them. So, so if you could increase this understanding in the education, I think that would certainly help in, uh, in my field. Anyone else direct comments, Risto Silasma? Yeah, I think Aalto University is, is moving in a very good direction in this respect because of the, the combination of sort of the, the dreams and details or the, the magic and the science. And the dreams are entrepreneurial dreams. They are dreams of having a real impact on how the world works. It's an impatience that is built into fire in your belly. And then the details or the science is, of course, the, what people learn in their PhD studies. And whether they are well taught through that formal part, I think it depends on, on the department and on the professor overseeing them. And it's impossible to give a, a general answer, a generic answer to that. But oftentimes the lack of this, this magic, this fire in the belly, this impatience, this need to have an impact is, is something that is a bigger problem than anything on the formal side. And if we could well combine these two, I think we would take a major step forward. And Aalto is actually doing that in a nice way. And I, I know that many other universities have also done that, and what you talked about internships is, is exactly in the same, same domain as well. Yeah, I mean, maybe just... Uh, oh, sorry, John. Go ahead. Um, I was going to say, ironically, that I think that the typical PhD is far worse trained to be an academic than they are to go to industry. That's exactly what I was uh, going to say. Okay. okay. Um, so uh, typically, we we uh, we kind we kind of tend to cook the uh, the person who's just got their PhD for uh, three to four years more as a postdoc before we would dream of hiring them as a as a faculty person. Uh, and one of the reasons is that. Um, Actually, ironically, I'm going to say this, this is not universally true, but a reason is that uh, sometimes a PhD that wants to go to industry has done these relationship with industry, they're problems driven by real world things, they get that, all of that, and they're ready to just go there. The student that doesn't want to go to industry may be very much ivory tower, uh, thinking about very you know dry problems away from any practical, but they, that may also mean they're, they're actually quite narrow uh, and, and quite uncreative. 
Uh, and if they want to be an academic, they're going to have to inspire other students, uh, teach undergraduate classes, write research project funding proposals, you know, a whole range of activities which require just what you said, you know, fire in the belly, you have to have a bit of spark. <laughs> and unfortunately, that might be the person who, it, you know, has just gone to industry, not staying in the university position. Um, that's not always true. There are some people who have some weird, crazy, idealistic vision and they also have, you know, a desire, you know, to do this cool research but also teach people, of course. And, you know, I think that's the, the common factor in good universities. Um, and of course, that's who you want to hire. Um, but I do observe that, you know, the people we don't want to hire are often people, uh, yeah, you're kind of, well, that, yeah, <coughs> yes, well. <laughs> but what you're saying is that regardless of the career path, we need to lit that fire. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah. And I think, I mean, what I was going to say, which is sort of, you know, almost very close to what John was saying, is that in some sense, I think our problem is uh, in, in academia, actually attracting those people to stay in academia, um, because some of the excitement that's created in companies uh, now is, is such that uh, academia is seen mm. as uh, relatively actually not exciting. Especially in your field. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> DeepMind or all these, these startup companies. And we need to, I mean, I think it's a challenge to us in academia to create the scale of excitement and projects that uh, matches what's happening in industry. I mean, I think our typical sort of, well, we'll do, you know, a fairly, you know, isolated piece of research into this, this topic with, you know, a three-year project or something is simply not you know, not, not, not cutting it in terms of what would attract some of the top researchers mm -hmm. to stay in academia. We need to be able to pitch, yeah, we're going to do AlphaGo or whatever it might be, or some, you know, scale of project at that sc scale that will create that excitement. And, and maybe that's going to be through having collaborations with industry. Um, that may be the right model, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, it, we're the, in a way, the gauntlet has been thrown down to us to match the excitement that industry is creating. So one uh, clear outcome of this is that we really uh, need to focus the education on letting the people find what they are interested in and, and what makes them spark and, and shine and, and find their way. But something that Lea said is, is also true is putting things into a larger context. And another thing we're doing here at Alto or starting and trying to do is to focus on multidisciplinarity or <laughs> transdisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity. It has a hundred different words, but working across different fields and bringing people from different fields to work together. And there's, of course, two sides of that. One is that uh, when, when you uh, move on to uh, working with people from different fields, you're not diving as deep into your particular topic as, as you would otherwise. And the question is, how do, you, how do we find the right balance between the depth and the breadth? And the, question, the second question is, uh, should we have people who have the capability of themselves working in multiple fields, and how much should we uh, train people who actually have specific knowledge deep in, in one field and are capable of working with other people with skills in other fields. And there's a, there's a uh, good balance uh, that I think we're still seeking in, in our education as well as in our research activities and in our collaborations. So I wonder if, if you have any thoughts on, on uh, how to embed multidisciplinarity in uh, PhD level education? I think it's a very good question. Um, uh, yeah, I favor the person who can dig d deep into one area but is able to communicate with people and draw an understanding of the problems. Um, I fear that people who just go at a sort of relatively shallow level into a number of areas and put them together aren't going to really come to fundamental discoveries and advances. Mm -hmm. that, that's my personal opinion. I'm not sure I'm right, but that's my view of that. It's a very good question, mm. I, I think. Like a, I, I think it, it also comes to the, 
the fact that typically, uh, I think most people uh, develop in the sense that when you do your PhD, uh, you have to be focused, otherwise you will never get done, I think, and, and also in many other sense it's important. But when, when you, during your years, you, when you, in, 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 in your job, then typically you, m most of us, I think, get a, a broader understanding. So, and then if, if we are successful in, in establishing research groups where you have these more senior people and junior, then this kind of um, education happens in a way naturally, of course. I mean, I, I don't know. Of course, uh, the university can provide certain skills uh, to students already, but uh, I personally feel that it's more more, in fact, learning by doing. Uh, and it certainly, after all, I think also depends on the personality. So not everybody can be both. And then, yeah, as you said, there has to be a balance. But maybe, yeah, if you manage to bring people together and then, then you can have different people and then the overall result is, is better than trying to find all the char characteristics in one, one PhD, mm. students or, yeah. Your question is challenging because it's, it's very, there's a strong temptation to just answer that, of course, we need both and sort of brush mm -hmm. off the, the question. Mm -hmm. But, of course, we need those people who go really deep. But at the same time, we have this pragmatic approach to it. That what they study should lead to something. And when they actually want to do that something, they need others from other fields. If you think about Bell Labs, you know, the, the guys who invented the, the Unix or, or the transistor or if you look at that first transistor, they made it by hand. It was not just blackboard and, and formulas, but they actually made that thing. And it's still something that is integral to Bell Labs. People do things with their own hands. Everybody who enrolls or joins Bell Labs, they will have to do those things themselves. And you need both the deep dive as well as the ability to work in a team so that you get the things done. So, for example, Massey MIMO, which some of you may know what that is, it's, it's sort of great to see how the first Massey MIMO antennas, they were sort of put together with chewing gum and duct tape. <laughs> and like we have this demo where we have the Massey MIMO antenna behind a painting on the wall, so that you, it can be in your living room. And then we can measure your heartbeat using that, in addition to providing you with data connectivity. And some PhD with a very high salary has been going to a department store, buying that frame and putting a picture in it, and then assembling the, the antenna on the backside, and then screwing hinges to that and screwing it to the wall. And you have to have that approach. Business people are by definition, multidisciplinary. And the challenge for business people, especially at the leadership positions, is that we, we tend to lose the ability to go deep. And actually, we tend to become really shallow, too shallow. And I have, for example, been on a, on a mission lately to, to teach business people, CEOs and chairmen, about machine learning. Because they don't really understand what that is, not at all. They can talk about it for 15 minutes, saying smart things, but they don't understand what it does and how it works. And they should, because people come to them with all sorts of claims, and they have no idea whether th those claims are factual or not. They, they will just believe anything or, or everything, depending on who is saying that, whether they trust the person or not. 
and yet that may, in their opinion, be as a technology, the, the one technology that best defines their competitiveness down the road, and yet they don't spend time understanding how that technology works. So I think we, we need to have a very holistic approach to that, teaching the generalists to go deep, or at least deeper, and then teach the people who naturally go deep to actually join forces with others. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, uh, I, I, I agree with you that, that uh, first of all, the PhD student should go deep and uh, should be as professional as possible. Otherwise, so uh, they can't publish their scientific paper. But in the meantime, uh, they have to know, okay, so s some other world. And uh, actually, so my field is uh, in a mixture of chemistry and physics so that the uh, and uh, once I was a researcher in superconductivity research lab, which is a mixture of en electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, chemistry, material science, physics, and uh, everything. So that, uh, okay, so by communicating with each other, we know the, uh, okay, some uh, research background is very, very important. Uh, at that time, I realized so. So that, uh, so, uh, I think the one strong area, one strong specialty is very, very important. And also, uh, we should know the other areas as, okay, so other areas and uh, other disciplines. So in order to mix all of this, then we can create something new. Thank you. Any comments from the audience on multidisciplinarity and it implementing it within doctoral education. Hello, has anyone been in involved? It's an involved equally difficult in question for the audience as well. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. There is one. Okay, I'll, I'll ask a question. Um, it was very interesting that uh, there was a general feel that, you know, at the end of the PhD, you want someone with passion to do, whether it's in, in academia or, or in industry. Um, and I'm actually quite confident that, you know, well-established senior professors, you know, you have a choice of literally hundreds of doctoral candidates that you could take into your labs. Um, how do you take in the right person at the beginning so that whether three or four years later, the right person comes out. This is, this is the, the big choice. And maybe, so Professor Terasaki and then one of our uh, British colleagues maybe, what is your perspective on that? Mm. Well, yeah, actually we have some, okay, uh, strict uh, entrance exams, so that, uh, okay, we have some very uh, severe interview for the, okay, uh, PhD candidate. And uh, yeah, so that uh, I hope we could uh, select the proper person. Uh, in three or four years, they, they can get a PhD. And uh, well, and uh, for for uh, for me, it's a big pro problem. Is that uh, whether or she or he or she uh, can go to the uh, okay can stay in academia or can go to the industry? So it's a very big problem, uh, big, big question for me, and uh, so, uh, yeah, at the moment I have no clear answer for that, but, but anyway, so the, okay, uh, uh, capability of the PhD candidate is, okay, properly selected at the entrance exams. Which John wants to answer? Yeah. Um, yeah um, well, we interview everyone. Everyone who applies to the PhD has to submit a proposal, and uh, typically a couple of pages. Uh, we kind of like people that have done a master somewhere we know about and they've even published a paper or two or maybe more sometimes. Uh, there's the, a lot of my students I like, well, Cambridge and actually at UCL I have very, very good experience with students too. They're in great London in general, Imperial and UCL, very, very good students. Uh, 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 Oxford and Cambridge, you know, it's kind of a quite a few good UK universities. Um, but um, you, you actually notice something about the person, personality, 
when they're applying. There's some persistence about their interest, not, not an annoying persistence, but you know, an insistence that they have an idea. It may not be the idea that makes their PhD. That's actually very similar to a startup. People do a startup and then the thing that succeeds is something else. So you start on a PhD, but you want them, you want them to be coming in with that energy. Uh, so actually, you, you, know, you like to even start with the thing you want them to go out with as well. And I, you know, I was literally writing a reference for a guy I hadn't seen for a while who's a faculty in another university now, and I looked up his first email to me and he said, you know, I'm, I'm at this conference and I really want to come talk to you about doing a PhD with you. And I'm like, why is this guy at a conference if he hasn't done a PhD? And he's like, he had a paper at the conference. So, so it's like, oh, well, okay, that would be interesting to start with. And then, you know, he was working for a deadly English defense company, which was very, very boring. Um, and he wanted to escape that. And I was like, okay, I will help you escape that terribly boring company um, because, you know, you want to do this interesting work. And um, uh, so, and that's sort of fairly typical. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, it, it doesn't always work. I mean, sometimes things fizzle out, but um, um, and sometimes people look not quite so good. But we, we unfortunately, you know, we don't always have funding for people. And sometimes somebody shows up with their own government funding, and they look okay. They got good grades. They talk the talk. It's okay. We take them, and then you know they turn out to be a bit boring, and then they get it. And if you put them in an environment with other people and other problems, you do create uh, 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 you know a possibility that they kind of flourish as well. Um, in fact, one of my best recent students, a woman from Pakistan, who now is a postdoc at UCL, and, and she came in from having done a master's at Berkeley, it was pretty cool, um, and she was quite quiet, and I had no idea what she wanted to do, and she did absolutely amazing. She got a sequence of best papers each year of her PhD, ended with a best paper at NDSS or a best paper at whatever, um, because the environment, she worked across networks and security and worked in censorship on the internet. Um, and, and that involved some, some social science. And luckily, our security research group had got heavily involved in the idea of looking at economics and psychology of security and had created an interdisciplinary group. Uh, the head of that group, Ross Anderson, had worked very, very hard to engage, including most recently hiring a new faculty person who's got a psychology background but did a PhD in the psychology of hackers by interviewing criminals. Really, really cool. So we have an environment where you get that interdisciplinarity. And this student sort of landed in that environment and just t totally took on where she previously worked in internet measurement. Suddenly it's, oh, wow, there's all these pieces and they all fit together. Now do that. Um, uh, so, you know, there's a kind of combination of things that can help. But, uh, yeah, you do, I, we do a lot of work. We interview everyone who applies, uh, which is a lot of work. And we get a lot of applicants. I mean, the numbers are really, you know, uh, I, th I think I see about a thousand emails a year of people saying, I quite like to do a PhD in your group, which uh, most of them are not going to happen because they don't have uh, grades that will make us look any further. But, uh, but that's still just, you know, the filtering is a horribly lot of work. Um, uh, any other? Yeah, I mean, I just endorse I mean, I think that um, it is quite hard often, and grades are not a good measure. I mean, I think the fire in the belly is what you're looking for. And mm -hmm. actually, you know, the very high grade people, maybe peop some of them may be people who have, uh, you know, been f too focused on just getting the grades, you know. And this is true at undergraduate level as well, you know, the mm. people who get the best score from high school. Maybe the people who've spent every evening just studying for that exam. And those not, aren't necessarily the people who are going to be, you know, actually broader understanding, more creative, you know, maybe they slip to grade, these people who've taken other interests. So you, you know, actually want to be a little bit more flexible in thinking about what actually are the criteria in terms of objective criteria. And I think the best way of doing that is through interview, even, mm -hmm. even if that's in itself faulty as well. But it is trying to get to understand, you know, what, what makes people tick and how can they meet new challenges that are different from the ones they may have seen before? Do they have that kind of, you know, get up and go and, and, and uh, interest, fire in the belly, yeah. Thank you. Returning a little bit to, to what Gary Marquis brought up, the, the recruitment criteria and the uh, uh, qualities of the individuals that, that we select. Each one of you has worked a lot with uh, either PhD students or young PhD graduates. If just in one or two words you would have to characterize, what are the main characteristics of those people that 
sort of are, sig are signals of success in the future? What kind of characteristics, if you look back in your career, what type of people uh, fare the best in the future? So what, what are the... I'm implying that these are the characteristics you're looking for in, in people that you recruit. Let's take a quick round, everybody, just a couple um, of qualities. It, it, it's not always consistent. I see different things. So the one, one thing in, in computer science is people uh, do use interdisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity to generate ideas. Uh, so, you know, there's a cliche of reading science fiction or speculative fiction because that's often written in a way where you take everything about society and exaggerate one piece of technology or one piece of society in a very long way along one axis and then see what happens. And that's a good way of g generally coming up with ideas uh, or, or by association where you just throw two ideas from different areas together and see how they, how they mesh and, or not. Um, and people that have that kind of you know, that, that just innately think those kinds of ways of coming up with an idea. But then they back off and go and do all the thorough work <laughs> necessary, you know, and filter out the terrible outputs as well. Um, that's kind of the, the thing I see that, that works. Thank you. Uh, I, I always say also in, in my institute that people should be curious, curious about what the others are doing and uh, open in that sense, open to new ideas. And curiosity means also that they respect uh, ideas and, and opinions of other people. Hmm? Yeah, I think that's a great, a great uh, <coughs> characteristic that's really important for multidisciplinary work. If you aren't able to un, you know, sort of appreciate what other people are doing, you're not going to be able to really work with them creatively. Um, I, yeah, I, I, it's very hard to predict. I think, you know, that sort of get up and go ability to think uh, and, and be adaptive. Um, one of my best sort of theoretical students went on to kind of um, do really quite innovative work in control theory, um, but then he became a Buddhist monk, so I don't know whether that's a success story or not. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I can't, I can't beat that. <laughs> <laughs> but I can only repeat what I have said before, the, the fire in the belly or the passion about uh, this is what I want to do, but it's a real-world problem. It's something that has the, an impact and meaning. And the willingness to, to cross bridges to, for example, go to the department store and buy a painting frame because that's the best way to demonstrate in real life what we have come up with. You do like, like vectoring, which you probably know about in, in data communication over copper, copper wires. Great science, but you need to build some gadgets before you can prove it. And, and we need people who are both willing to do the, the science part as well as then build things to prove that it works. And then oftentimes the commercial realities will hit and what they built is not actually something that could, can be commercialized. So further challenges and they, they need to have that passion to pursue it until the end so that it's something that we can bring to people because otherwise it will not have an impact. Even if the prototype works, but it's not feasible in some way to scale it, then they need to continue. And they want to, want to do that. Okay, so I'm sorry, but I have to say that uh, the first necessary condition is uh, deep understanding of fundamental physics and mathematics. The second condition is curiosity. And the third one, English. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to uh, thank the panelists and I hope you thoroughly enjoy your stay here at Alto. Thank you very much. Thank you.